Chapter 1. The Sheep Gate. Falling in Love. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Maah they sanctified it, unto the tower of Hananiel. Nehemiah 3 1. And between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Nehemiah 3 32. My parents came to the Lord before I was born, so I can't remember a time when we didn't go to church frequently or have the Lord as the center of our lives. I do, however, recall when I surrendered my life to Him as an adult. Just out of college, I spent a year trying to make up for all the fun experiences I felt my Christian upbringing had caused me to miss. But every relationship, activity, and pursuit led me nowhere but back to my need for God. During this time, I realized for myself that I wanted God to be the center of my life. Many people flirt around with him before they realize that selling out to God is the answer to the void inside. Something happens when we finally understand that Christ gave his life for us. We want to give ours to him. We become a new creation. At the time, I hadn't been working long at my teaching job in Cornersville, Indiana. My driving partner and I were always trying to find shorter routes for our 30-minute commute. Finally, we discovered a curvy little driven country road that shaved off a few minutes. We became quite adept at maneuvering through twists among cornfields as we drove the route every afternoon for two months. One morning, I went into work by myself and decided to try the road going to and not just from my job. I'd traversed the same route every afternoon for eight weeks, but because I was going the opposite direction, it seemed like a new one. So it is with giving our lives to God. When we're born again, we turn around and go a different direction, though we're still in the same territory. We live in the same house, work at the same job, shop at the same stores, but now everything is different and new. We have new perspectives desires, and hopes. We see the world through Christ's eyes and can never go back to the barrenness of what we once desired. The Sheep Gate In Nehemiah 3, the first gate of the wall that was repaired was the Sheep Gate. The foundation for all other gates we go through is salvation, for the gate of salvation, Jesus, is where we all begin our kingdom trek. As a matter of fact, he said, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. John 10.1 All of us must be born again one way, through Jesus Christ. See John 14.6 His death gave access to this entry point of our Christian journey. When we commit to making Jesus our Lord, He becomes our shepherd, and we become His sheep. The sheep gate was the first to be repaired, but it's also the only gate Nehemiah mentioned two times in this chapter. This repetition brings us full circle around the walls because everything starts and ends with Jesus. No matter where our journey takes us, we're never far from the sheep gate. If you look at Appendix 1, the sheep gate was at the northwest corner near the temple and was rebuilt by Eliashib which means the God of conversion. It had no locks, for this gate of salvation stays perpetually open for sinners to come in. One tower was placed on each side. Mea, also called the Tower of the Hundred, and Hananiel, grace or gift of God. Old Testament towers were an important part of a wall's defense. Each tower that was on the wall, including Mea and Hananiel, had a watchman who provided protection against potential enemies or imminent problems. For me, the towers represent the diligence of those watchers. Today, we would call them intercessors. We probably came through the sheep gate by our intercessors' efforts. In essence, Hananiel, or God's grace, is at the gate as a convert enters. 
For many of us, grandma or mom and dad were our watchers on the wall for us to come in this gate. We entered here as a result of God's grace and their watching over us and praying tirelessly for our salvation. Sacrifice The sheep gate is synonymous with sacrifice. Since people brought sheep for sacrificing in through this gate, it was set aside as sacred. We too must become consecrated for God at this sheep gate. As we commit to our shepherd, sacrifice is crucial, and that's a decision many struggle with. A lot of unsaved people wonder how they can possibly forfeit all they've ever known for Christ. That's a natural reaction because a lot of us are keepers of old shoes, outdated clothes, useless treasures. Now we choose to replace our desires and character with His, and we gain far more than we lose. Just as Jesus gave Himself, we start to change into what He wants us to become. When we truly repent, we don't long, like Lot's wife, for what was left behind. Our desires and goals simply become different. I've seen many people whose countenance has even changed. We give up the carnal side of ourselves to be transformed into whatever He wants us to become. Jesus is our model of sacrifice. He was oppressed and He was afflicted. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so He opened not His mouth. Isaiah 53, 7 See also Acts 8.32. In Bible days, sacrificial lambs were spread out to be sacrificed in a cross position with their heads down. Hebrews were so accustomed to this sacrificed ritual that when John recited the words over Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1.29b, they made a connection. As John baptized Jesus in Jordan and declared who he was, people had clues to Jesus' majesty. He was validated as Messiah for the first but not the last time. He was the Lamb of God, our Lamb who was also sacrificed on a cross. With Jesus as our model, when we surrender ourselves, we no longer retain the same interests, attitudes, or character. We give those up to take on Jesus' character. Romans 12.1 says to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Like Jesus, we must sacrifice ourselves for the new creature we become. Sheep's Significance The first biblical reference to sheep, or livestock of any kind, is found in Genesis 4, 2-4. When Abel, their keeper, pleased God. I grew up in the Midwest, so I understand the value of livestock. Not having grown up on a farm, however, I'm limited in my appreciation of sheep. Despite what a farmer sees in them, I consider them less valuable than other animals. To me, they're dirty, dumb, and ugly. Perhaps God chose sheep to be a comparison to us because that's how we might be described before we accepted Jesus into our lives. The world sees the negative in us, but not God. He doesn't look at us with the eye of the critical city slicker, but with the love of a shepherd who adores his sheep. We should learn what God has to say about sheep since the Bible refers to them about 400 times— the most frequently mentioned animal in the Bible. When Scripture deals so often with a topic, it usually holds a special meaning. Sheep possess many traits similar to ours. First, they're raised in all places of the world, even dry places because their bodies can adapt. I often hear Christians complain because they're not in the church, marriage, job, or city they'd really like to be in. That happens to all of us at different stages in our life's journey. We're sometimes in fertile places and sometimes in dry places, but we must learn to grow wherever we find ourselves. Grow where you are planted. It's good advice. Christian sheep exist throughout the nations, and even though some are still persecuted as much as the first century church was, 
those churches are thriving. Second, sheep are neither intelligent nor wise. They get easily flustered and confused. Sometimes, even when their flock is nearby, they can't make their way back to the others. In the world's estimation, that lack of intelligence is a negative trait. But God doesn't choose his sheep because they're the smartest or strongest he can find. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Deuteronomy 7.7 says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. In other words, we're not the strongest he could find, but the most in need of help. Amy Semple McPherson had emotional problems. William Branham was poor and semi-literate, and A. A. Allen had drinking issues. The sheep he chooses and leads into a godly destiny are chosen in spite of and because of their weaknesses. My husband and I once had a woman pastor to whom the Lord spoke frequently. He would sometimes reveal words to her that she didn't know the meanings or pronunciations of, so he'd spell them for her. God was obviously giving her revelation beyond her intellect so he could receive the praise. Despite their shortcomings, great men and women of God have been used mightily for his work. He picks us even though we're least because we're teachable, and his ability can shine through us. He wants us because we're weak and need the shepherd to guide us. One great paradox of our Christianity is that God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians 1.27a Sheep certainly fall into that group. Sheep were also important to Hebrews for many other reasons. They provided food, cosmetics, clothes, wool, meat, leather, glue, soap, tallow, suet, fat for cooking, fertilizer, and cat gut. As sheep, we too can be used for many purposes, even though we feel we have nothing to offer the kingdom. We can be teachers, pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, intercessors, mentors, and a myriad of other things. Sometimes our job is just to clean the church, drive the bus, to pick up children or gather trash in the parking lot. Nevertheless, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Ecclesiastes 9.10a That's a lesson that will help us in all the gates. For each task we do for God, whether big or small, fosters characteristics God will ultimately use. The flock. Sheep don't function well by themselves, they are made to be watched and cared for by the shepherd as part of his flock. They aren't creatures equipped to survive by themselves. As Christian sheep, we must find the support of a flock or church. Paul cautioned us about forsaking the assembly of ourselves together because he realized we need fellowship as a crucial part of our maturing. Hebrews 10.25 when my husband and I mentor young Christians, we stress the importance of being associated with a church flock. Many troubles new Christians encounter come because they didn't create a bond with other members of an assembly to whom they were accountable. If we foster a support system with a church flock, we can more successfully withstand problems that come along. That doesn't mean our flock itself is without issues. In every group of animals, or even people, there's a pecking order to see who's fittest. For sheep, it's a butting order. The more domineering sheep vie for a higher place and butt away the lambs. Often, within both a sheep and a church flock, more aggressive ones thrust with side and with shoulder and push all the diseased with their horns till they scatter them abroad. Ezekiel 34, 21. 